Um, thank you very much. So I'm actually giving part two of the Uranus experience. My colleague Dominique introduced uh, our consortium yesterday morning. So I'm going to be talking to you today about how my organization provides climatic information for different decision makers. And so um, very, very briefly, because Dominique has already touched upon this yesterday, Oranas is a consortium on regional climatology and adaptation to climate change. So our mandate is to acquire and develop knowledge on climate change, but also help our users assess um, different adaptation measures. And so what I'm going to be talking to you today about, if I can get this working, is really my experience in the Climate Scenarios and Services Group. So yesterday, Dominique introduced the climate simulations, and on the other side, we have the impacts and adaptation group. So my group in between here really um, digests the information from the climate simulation into something that the impacts and adaptation group can use. So you'll notice right off the start that our projects are divided into 10 different programs ranging from hydrology, built environment, agriculture, health, to tourism. <clears throat> so you can imagine right from the start that that implies a large variety of different decision makers, different users of climate information. So um, when we talk about climate information, I hope that you'll agree with me that as climate scientists, we've made great progress at producing climate information that is very scientifically interesting, but we're also trying to make progress at producing climate information that is also relevant to users, to decision makers, which is not necessarily uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the same thing. So in that sense, um, we feel that climate science is becoming more actionable. We see that our users are starting to move from a more reactive mode to adaptation to climate change to something that is more proactive. And so having said that, um, making decisions in the face of climate information or climate change is not straightforward. There are large numbers of opportunities and vulnerabilities that our decision makers are increasingly asked to deal with. And simply retrieving and um, obtaining the relevant climate information that they need is not easy for them. And that is only but one step, really, in the decision-making process. And by that, I mean something um, that looks a little bit like this. So when you go through um, deciding what to do about climate change, you go through a series of steps, which I've I outlined here. Anything from first getting prepared, putting a team together, learning about your current vulnerabilities, understanding climate change, future vulnerabilities, prioritizing adaptation measures, and putting that into action. What I'm going to be talking to you about today is really um, the, third, the third step. So understanding climate change. How do we help our decision makers discern the proper climate information that they need to make decisions? So I'm currently writing a guide uh, specifically on that topic and there are three main objectives to my guide, uh, which I just want to briefly touch upon today. Is this not working? Working. There we go. Okay, so um, my three main objectives are to really categorize our users, our decision makers, in terms of their climate information needs. We want to help them uh, understand how we can present climate information in different forms, how there are different types of climate information that can be of use to them. Um, and I also want to highlight a number of case studies where we've actually made decisions based on climate information. Okay, can I just go back? <laughs> How do I go back now? No, it's not going back.
Okay, I'll just go on to my next slide. I'll pretend that I remember what it was. So um, we have basically, for this guide, two main, audience, uh, two main audiences. So our first audience are really our decision makers, the ones that uh, are trying to make decisions. And we want to basically give them a roadmap to how to use climate information into adaptation decisions. We want to really increase their capacity, increase their understanding of climate change, increase their understanding of the climate information that better suits their needs. Next one. Yeah, perfect. Um, and then uh, we also have climate service providers as an audience because we want to make them realize that we can't put all decision makers into the same category. We need to get a better understanding of the different types of decision makers that we have and find ways to properly format climate information in a way that speaks to them, just like we've been talking about um, for the general public, for example. So when we talk about decision makers, the first ones that may come to mind are policy makers. But in fact, adaptation cl to climate change will have to occur at different multiple levels. And so we have a very large number of different decision makers in our view. Um, and there are a number of different questions that we can ask to decide what type of decision maker that we have in front of us. Things like at what stage of the process are they in terms of making a decision for adaptation? Do they have a direct or indirect use of climate scenarios? What's their level of expertise in terms of understanding climate scenarios? What climate, climatic statistics are they interested in? Are they looking at means? Are they looking at extremes, for example? Do they have an emphasis more on biophysical problems or more on social problems? What's the importance of, the importance of considering some or all of the uncertainty in their decision making? What's the potential for mainstreaming adaptation in their current management plan? What's their allocation for resources in the short, medium, long terms. So these are the kinds of questions that when a user walks through the door, we have to ask them to decide, okay, where do they fit in? What kind of climate information will suit their needs? User type um, kind of view. We also have kind of a um, user needs view. There's a lot of information on this table. I realize I'm not gonna have time to go through it all. But this is a table of user needs that our impacts and adaptation group has been working with for a couple of years. And it essentially categorizes users in terms of their level of expertise, whether there's value added in using very specific climate scenarios, whether they're involved in research and development. And basically, we can categorize user needs in th into three main categories which is what I'll do for today, basic needs, intermediate needs, and sophisticated needs. Um, and so this is, to me, um, kind of a wordy version of the pictogram Gavin Schmidt showed yesterday with very simple to very hard um, climate information. So from there, um, we can sort of discern what our users are and what they might want. There's still a challenge, and the challenge is that we need to do a bit of both, finding out what type they are and what their needs are. By that, I mean that um, if you're looking at users by their type, you can say, okay, in front of me, I have a user that is only starting their reflection on climate change versus a user that I feel is ready to make a decision on climate change. And right off the bat, if you consider their needs, you would most likely put them in a very basic for the one that's starting its reflection and sophisticated uh, needs in terms of climate information for the one that is um, ready to make a decision. But that is re really not um, what we see. We have users that make decisions in terms of adaptation to climate change using very simple basic information. And I'll show you what I mean by basic to sophisticated in a minute. Um, for example, 
the contrary would be true as well. For example, um, hydrologists, which are very good at using climate information, are to us very sophisticated users. But hydrologists are not necessarily ready or more ready than other, other users to make adaptation decisions. It'd be also like saying all university research researchers that walk through our door have the same needs. That's simply not the case. And so what kinds of questions do we have to ask our users, our decision makers, when they come see us so that we know what they need? So that's one, um, one story. So from that, from the discussions that we have with our decision makers, we can cater the information to suit their needs. And by, what I mean by that is this. So going from something that is very, uh, what I would qualify as a very basic climatic information format, a summary table of changes, be it temperature or precipitation. I realize this is very small, but it's just to give you an idea. So here you have changes in precipitation for different seasons over two horizons for southern Quebec. We use things like this, for example, in studies that are uh, vulnerability studies. Are we, is there a chance that climate change will affect us? And you go on from there. They don't need very sophisticated graphs with a million sp spaghetti um, lines showing them a million, <coughs> excuse me, scenarios. Um, so that's very basic information. When we, okay, I can do that, I have to remember. Uh, something that's a little bit more complex, um, an example of information that we give often to foresters and forest resources are maps of changes in temperature for a very specific reason, region. This was done for a forest productivity project, for example. So we tailor the information to something that they understand that they can use in their project. Similarly, for something that is more um, intermediate, would be using um, climate analogs. So it's the same information, really, that you can uh, present in a graph format like this. You can present this in a table format. Now you're showing it as a spatial analog for an agricultural study looking at the risk of seeing new invasive species. And actually, <clears throat> this study was picked up by our local media just yesterday. They wrote <clears throat> a news piece on that. Totally losing my voice. Okay, um, next is uh, a more sophisticated example of what we can do. This was done for engineers looking at changing norms for road construction and culvert construction. So looking at an index, uh, probability maximum precipitation, which is much more complex, much more difficult to calculate. The, the format of this figure would not suit a user that is just walking through our door and doesn't understand anything about climate projections, doesn't understand um, <clears throat> the variability, et cetera, in what we're trying to show. So that's one of our jobs is to talk to your, our users and figure out what kind of format. And there are obviously many more. I'm showing you four basic examples here. What we have to remember is that while we're tailoring the information, there are a few key messages that we want to send out to all our users whether they're very novice users or very sophisticated users. Some of the messages are that they need to understand the, ver the natural variability, need to understand the variability, for example, in the observation. Thank you so much. In the, the variability in the past climate. So we've seen, uh, Dr. Ali showed that figure many, many times. There is a upward trend, but that doesn't mean that every single year is going up. Our users need to understand that. And by understanding that, it helps them understand that climate scenarios are doing the same thing. We're saying that there's going to be an uphill uh, trend, but it doesn't mean that every single year, starting from now, for example, is also going to be on the uphill uh, trend. We also uh, try to reconcile Past, recent past with um, 
projected trends. And here, really, I'm sh only showing it in this bottom left figure, where you have the trend in the reference period and you have the future projected changes. So you can reconcile what's been happening with what you expect. So trying to get the um, decision maker to relate to something that they've already experienced helps in their decision making process. We also obviously always give an, an ensemble of scenarios. We give a range, we give an uncertainty. We do it here in terms of um, giving a range of precipitation. We give it here with a median change with 10 90th percentile. Uh, same idea with a range for the temperature analog. And here it's shown as a box plot. So that uncertainty, that range for us is key. Uncertainty in decision making is often viewed as a barrier. We're trying to make it an add-on value, something that they need to consider to make more robust decision. We can't give them one future. One future, which one do you choose? They need to understand that. They need to take the bracket into consideration. So, to conclude, I hope that I've conveyed that just like we need to format information for perhaps different public audiences, we also have a very large number of different decision makers, and we also have to learn to cater to different decision makers. To us, the relevance of the information that we give them is going to be achieved by talking to the user. User involvement from the start is very important. Education, transparency, responsibility is also something that we try to convey. We educate our user as they move through that process. <clears throat> we are very transparent in the choices that we make, and we try to have a shared responsibility. So if we decide to use 10 clim climate scenarios versus 100 climate scenarios, they need to understand why we did that, and they are okay with that as well. To us, doing this, finding the correct format, and giving them the proper information right from the start means that we increase the chances that they come back for more, that we have a continual relationship and more projects with them. And I'm gonna advocate a little bit for my, my role, is that uh, just like we need very good people to digest the information for the public, we also need organizations or scientists that can digest the information for decision makers. Because when we think about it, a lot of our decision makers are at a level that is not very far off from the general public. <clears throat>